rickety stairs lead to a damn chilly basement. Two sinks set off to the side and a single uncovered bulb offers very little lighting to Sylvia Likens and her makeshift dungeon. A pile of rags and old clothes offer very little in the way of a bed, no longer allowed to sleep upstairs with the others. Incontinence now a major factor in Sylvia's everyday life. One too many judo flips slamming her small body into the hard floor no longer protected with the mattress as it once was. Sylvia's kidneys were beginning to fail her. Damage has been done and she was incapable of controlling a function that she mastered at a very young age. Sylvia's body laid a road map out for medical examiners. Hundreds of small circular wounds litter her body thanks to the avid smoker in the home, using her as a personal ashtray. Unimaginable torture was happening to the defenseless 16-year-old girl, all at the hands of the woman who assured her parents that she would be taken care of. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight we are going to dive deeper into one of the worst torture crimes in America. The details are only going to get worse. Your empathy will hit an all-time high as the unthinkable is relived in this case of the murder and torture of Sylvia Marie Likens. A grown mother and woman jealous of a beautiful but timid 16-year-old girl. The very things she feared happening to her children were coming true, and Sylvia and her body became a punching bag for Gertie and her children. Neighborhood children were in and out of the home, and they too were incapable of turning down the offer to practice their judo, learn how to hit another human being, and laugh at the humiliation being dished out. Their impressionable minds were unable to recognize that the actions they were encouraged to perform were the very thing that would cause the death of their victim. Stick with me as we close out this case. This case is one that will forever go down as the most shockingly evil crimes in American history. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of torture, murder, and adult situations and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, everyone. Let's do a little bit of our weekly housekeeping before we dive in. If you haven't already, go follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The True Crime Librarian. This way you never miss an update on our cases or with the librarian. Life is unpredictable and I don't want any of my nerds in the dark with what is going on. Make sure you are subscribed on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube so you never miss an upload. And don't forget to turn on those notifications. And finally, head over to the merchandise store to snag yourself some librarian gear. This allows you to support the show and get a little of something for yourself. Keep an eye out as I have something new coming your way in the coming weeks with the merchandise store. Enough of this. Let's get back to the true crime. Last week we left off um, in the last weeks of Sylvia's life. The torment that Sylvia suffered fails in comparison to the last few weeks that she lived. And it's all thanks to the woman who had promised to take care of her. Gertrude seemed to have a way with getting the children to do what she wanted to. Her abuse, both physical and emotionally, was occurring more and more. And the kids were starting to pick up this bad habit. And I use air quotes because only they would develop a habit as sinister as this. Judo in 1965 was part of the martial arts world, but it was just becoming popular. And a lot of the neighborhood kids were starting to take lessons in this. And so they would come over 
and Koi would teach them how to flip each other using the judo moves. And his apparent martial art dummy was Sylvia. Now, inside of a judo, what what are they called? A judo center? Dojo? I don't know. There's mats laid down so that the person who is swept off their feet, flipped over in the air, and they have something to pad their landing so there's no injuries that occur. And at one time, when Koi first learned judo, he did have a mattress in the floor in the Baines Whiskey's home, and he would flip Sylvia over and over and over. Until one time, he flipped her and missed the mattress, and then all of a sudden, that was funny. Let's do it that way. That, that's the, the mentality that came from that accident. And so Sylvia began being flipped just right there onto the floor, no protection. And as we were discussing in the intro, her kidneys became damaged as a result of this. But also, Sylvia picked up the moves and how to use the other person and their force and their weight against them in order to flip them. And one time she flipped the young Jimmy Baines Whiskey, and he suffered from kidney problems prior to this flip. And so when the flip occurred, it angered Shirley, who had just turned 10 right before Sylvia and Jenny had moved into the home. And she slapped Sylvia across the face. And instead of scolding or fighting back, Sylvia just let that happen. And because she didn't fight back and she didn't put up any kind of resistance, it only encouraged the children to hit and punish her more. Sylvia's psychological abuse, the constant yelling and screaming about how much everyone in the home hated her and how she deserved everything that she was getting because, you know, she was some form of slut, prostitute, whore. All of that was destroying her, her self-esteem, which if you joined me last week, we talked a little bit about um, Sylvia's appearance. And she's a beautiful girl, a beautiful girl. She had this gorgeous curly hair and she had just the softest appearance to her face but always noticeable was when she smiled she never smiled large enough to show her teeth and that's because she was missing one and it 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 had occurred from an injury in an accident when she was younger she ran into her brother and it just knocked that front permanent tooth out and so she didn't have it and so she already had that little dent in her self-esteem so by Gertrude and Paula and and all the other kids calling her names and degrading her and humiliating her they just tore away at that self-esteem until she had none and it didn't take long for her to believe that what was occurring in the home and what was being dished out to her as far as punishments went she deserved it she she was believing that she deserved it. And in actuality, she had done nothing to deserve even half of what this poor girl was enduring day in and day out. Sylvia did seem to have someone that would sometimes fight for her when she couldn't. And Sylvia, nine times out of 10, wasn't fighting for herself. However, Stephanie Baines Whiskey, she's 15, so she was just a little bit younger. The two had become friends when they were going to school. It seemed like they had found a kindred spirit in one another. Stephanie was beautiful as well, unlike her sister or her mother. Not that they weren't pretty people. They were pretty in their way. But Stephanie and Sylvia had this natural beauty to them. And so Stephanie didn't view Sylvia as competition and she was able to get down and really connect with who Sylvia was. So they developed this bond and 
Stephanie would sometimes fight for Sylvia. She was not fully aware of as to why there was a constant array of just abuse going on. And she, she had to side with her family for the most part. Even though she wasn't seeing these things occur, she had to believe that her friend had lost her ever-loving mind and sometimes needed to be punished to make her get back in line, right? So in times when Stephanie saw the abuse going on and she knew it wasn't justified, she would stick up for Sylvia. If Stephanie saw Paula pick something up and use it as a weapon to hit Sylvia with, she would grab it out of Paula's hand, but no more that she would grab one weapon and Paula would pick something else and go to hit Sylvia again. It's just, it was just a constant constant thing going on and Stephanie did what she could but then there was times that she was also part of the problem. Paula she seemed to have this vengefulness about her when it came to Sylvia. We had talked about this Paula was pretty but she wasn't the natural beauty that her sister Stephanie or Sylvia was. She was pretty in her own way. She had convinced a married man to run off with her for a couple months. She ended up knocked up Now, his decisions after that fact, those were his, and I don't know if they were strictly based on Paula's appearance. I can't say that. I mean, there was probably more to the fact that um, he was married. He had given himself to his wife. And during that time, even though there was cheating, you still didn't walk away from your family because divorce and things like that were becoming more common, but they were still taboo. Like, no, no, nay, nay, don't do that. Paula, she, I don't know if maybe the fact that she felt that Sylvia was prettier than her was part of why Paula became so vengeful, or was it the fact that Paula was pregnant at this point with a married man's child, and he wanted nothing to do with her, and Sylvia wasn't pregnant. Sylvia had never done anything to put her virtue on the line, and Paula had. There was just, I mean, you could sit down and you could break this whole story down, and if you want to lay blame on one particular thing, you can. However, I think it's a combination. I think it's a deadly mix that has occurred between Gertrude and Paula and Sylvia. Those three, Sylvia being the victim, Paula and Gertrude, being extremely jealous and it was all for things that Sylvia couldn't help in the end it was things she couldn't change about herself Paula would actively sit down with her mother to discuss different methods of punishment Paula she had a sinister side and I would say this was inherited from her mother whether it's nature or nurture we can debate on that all day long It's a huge debate that goes into the world of serial killers and mass murderers and shooting sprees. The true crime world has heard the great debate, nature versus nurture. And we can look at that all day long and we can dissect this. But at the end of the day, you have to inherit some sort of personality and then you have to be nurtured to listen to that part of yourself and to commit the acts that we view as heinous. There is a combination. It's called the perfect storm. Okay, you have to have some of these inherited traits. And then it has to be like a garden. It has to be, so you inherit it, your your seed's planted, and then it needs to be watered, it needs to be taken care of, it needs to be fed, it needs to be weeded, in order for it to mature into something ugly. It's a perfect storm. Stephanie, she was not perfect, and like we I said, sometimes she could see Sylvia do something and see the punishment come and in her mind tried to justify that what was happening was legitimate. 
And so sometimes Stephanie wouldn't see the, the indiscretion and therefore she would only get to hear about it from her family and picking somebody over your family is very hard. You, you don't want to think that they would ever lie to you or lead you down an ugly path. So sometimes Stephanie would add to the abuse. They all, the whole family seemed to handle their stress by physically taking it out on Sylvia. Stephanie came home one time and she found Sylvia. She was completely nude and she was standing in the middle of this group of onlookers and it included Gertrude. It included Jenny, Sylvia's younger sister. It included Ronnie Leeper, Johnny Baines Whiskey, and Paula Baines Whiskey. And once Stephanie got closer to the circle, she saw that Sylvia was nude and that there was a glass Pepsi bottle protruding from her vagina. The punishment was for Sylvia to put the Pepsi bottle inside of her and Gertrude demanded that it go deeper and further. This girl was 16. She had never experienced any kind of penetrative sex. And for her to have this foreign object placed inside of her body, not only is it humiliating because you have people watching, but it's painful. And Stephanie couldn't believe that Sylvia would do something like this. So people, it, it just was, she was baffled. And so instead of helping her out of this situation, Stephanie, she walks up and slaps the crap out of Sylvia and tells her to go up to her room. And that was the end of that. Everybody dispersed was like the the transgression never happened. No, she wasn't standing there inserting glass into her body. It was it, it one minute was there, the next it was gone. Gertrude was seriously jealous of Sylvia. And it's been pointed out on more than one occasion that this may be more envy than jealousy. And you can call it what you want to call it. Tomato, tomato, whatever. Bottom line, Sylvia had something that, that Gertrude wished she still had. At 16, Gertrude may have been a very beautiful girl. She's 37. She has had 13 pregnancies, resulting in seven children and six miscarriages. That's a lot. That takes a lot out on a person. And then for your children range from 17 to 1, you're a single parent, the person you walked away from your husband for, he's beat you and left you once you became pregnant with his child. And your 17-year-old daughter, well, she's having an affair with a married man. Life was tough for Gertrude. And unfortunately, the more stress you endure, the, the quicker your looks fail. If you're not taking care of yourself, which she wasn't. I mean, she had several lung ailments already on top of all the nervousness, all the stress, everything. So that's wearing down on her young body. But in Gertrude's mind, well, she still looks as good as Sylvia or Paula, or Stephanie, or even she did at 16. One time, Gertrude claimed to Sylvia, quote, I could pass for 20. I can put my fancy clothes on and saunter down the street and get the boys to whistle and honk at me, just like you do, Sylvia. So one problem with that statement, with that quote coming from Gertie, she says boys, not men. And we talked about this last week. Gertie's known for dancing around the house in front of the teenage boys. And I said, you know, as long as you're doing the chicken dance, but it's got some sexiness to it, they're going to get turned on no matter what. Unfortunately, teenage boys, it's like a light switch. Turn it on, turn it off. But for men, they're experienced. They know what they like. And they definitely know who doesn't have it. And unfortunately, Gertie could not attract the men of her age like she could attract the boys in their teenage years. So could this boil down to just jealousy over looks? Definitely. But I don't think that's all of it. I think it's just the eye of the storm. There's jealousy, there's stress, 
there's self-medication, there's not having enough money, there's, you know, your children are failing you and what you would hope they would grow up to be. You have no lover. Um, the only time he wants anything from you is for sex, money, or to smack you around a couple times. Nothing. There's nothing. So I think if you put all of that together with the fact that Gertrude was losing her looks and becoming jealous of Sylvia for very vain things, well, the perfect storm has made landfall and it's all hell's fixing to break loose. Now, I talked about Gertrude and her dancing. <laughs> What she was failing to see, or perhaps she did, and, and this is why she only danced for teenage boys, was that they only paid attention to her because she could offer them sexual experience. And maybe that's all it was for her as well. Maybe she was a very active woman with her sex life, and having multiple sexual partners was a desire for her, but it in 1965s that you know you were you were labeled for having multiple sexual partners and it wasn't pretty so did she project what was going on with her onto Sylvia very possible but for Gertie she couldn't control herself when it came to dancing for these boys and Richard Hobbs in particular enjoyed coming to the Baines Whiskey's home because Gertie would dance for him provocatively like they did down at the Fox Theater, which in 1965 in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Fox Theater was known for its burlesque type shows. So when Gertrude would dance around the living room and possibly be high on medication, sometimes a sliver of her stomach would, would poke out or she would touch herself in a way that a teenage boy would be like, ooh, this could get interesting, you know, whatever. But Richard Hobbs, it seemed like the only reason he came to the home was because Gertie had something to offer to him. And he, he had a desire to be a very sexual person. When Gertrude couldn't validate herself with the boys, this seems to be when she would be the most enraged and she took it out on Sylvia. Since Gertie was a chain smoker, she began using Sylvia and her skin as her personal ashtray. And putting these cigarettes out on her body caused several burn scars in a very small circular pattern. And how did Gertrude come up with this form of punishment? Well, Dennis Wright, of course. One time when Dennis and Gertrude had had a, one of their sexual experiences, he became angered with Gertrude over the fact that she either A, didn't have the money to give to him, or she made some ugly remark about his inconsistency in and out of her life. And he put his cigarette out on Gertrude's neck, leaving this painful small circle that eventually turned into a scar. Well, Gertie remembered to, that this had occurred. She remembered the amount of pain it had caused. And so why not use this as a form of punishment, right? I mean, it happened to me. It should happen to her too. That's the way Gertie felt about these things. Well, if Gertie wasn't stubbing cigarettes out on Sylvia, she was flicking lighted matches at her. But maybe back in the day, matches were still free. I know at some point when I was growing up, match little matchbooks were free. But I couldn't imagine lighting one of those and flicking it because they were very flimsy pieces of cardboard with this sulfur-like tip to them. I don't think they would have flown very far. But if you think to like what a matchstick is, that it's just a sliver of wood, that would probably be easier to flick. Nevertheless... Gertie decided, well, I don't have a cigarette in my hand, so let me flick a match or two. And she would start flicking these lighted matches towards Sylvia. Well, Sylvia caught fire one time. It was immediately put out, but Gertrude found humor in this. This case just, it irritates me. It does. On October 5th of 1965, 
That was Sylvia's last day at school. We had just had the incident where she had taken a gym uniform after Gertrude told her she would not pay for one. And Sylvia's teacher said she had to have one. And according to Sylvia, she had found the uniform on the sidewalk of the school. And she picked it up. It happened to fit. So she used it. Now, had Stephanie not been ill at home that day, she could have cooperated with Sylvia and hopefully saved her the fact that she would be removed from school. But unfortunately, Stephanie was sick that day and Gertrude didn't believe Sylvia and her story. So on October 5th of 1965, that was the day that Gertie decided to forbid Sylvia from attending school anymore. And this would be about the same time that Sylvia was made to sleep in the basement with the dog. When you open the door to the basement, it was adorned with these rickety stairs and it had two 90 degree turns. At least this is the way it's kind of described. And in the basement, it was very small and, a, and hanging was like a single bulb and a single chain. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen them a hundred million times. You pull the chain. Typically, they're in a farmhouse or in this like creepy, gotta scare you kind of type basement. Well, that's what was in this one. In the middle of the floor was this pile where Gertrude would throw like old rags and old clothes that the kids had tore up and it just hadn't been removed. So that was perfect as a bedding for Sylvia, right? For those of you who have not listened to my show, please know that was sarcasm. Off to the side of the basement, there were two industrial kind of sinks. And then underneath the stairs, or partially under the stairs, there was this coal furnace that heated the home. And if any of you have ever seen Home Alone when Kevin goes into the basement and he's scared of the furnace... That is what is in the basement of this home at 3850 East New York Street. It sticks out from the stairs because it's this monstrosity. And I see it randomly lighting itself up. Thanks, Home Alone. But that's all that was in this basement. There was nothing else. Some support beams, like you would expect, but that's it. It's cold. It's dark. It's musty. It's damp. It's disgusting. And that, well, that became Sylvia's personal dungeon. Due to Coy Hubbard and his habitual flipping of Sylvia practicing his judo, it had started to cause damage to her kidneys. And because of the damage, she was no longer able to hold it when she needed to go to the bathroom. If her bladder filled to a certain point, Her body automatically evacuated it. And this is what led ultimately to Sylvia being banished to the basement because she had peed on a couple of the mattresses. No matter how hard she tried and no matter how many times they withheld liquids from her, she would have accidents at night. And at 16, she probably mastered the skill of being a potty trained person around the age of two. So she's been doing this for 14 years. No problem. Come to Gertie's house, be flipped onto the hardwood floor. We got a problem. And had Gertie taken five minutes to take her to the doctor, there probably could have been something to treat this. But Gertie didn't care. She didn't want her to cost her any more money because $20 really wasn't covering it for Sylvia and Jenny. When happening, sometimes Sylvia would be brought up the stairs into the the main level of the home. And this was because it was just a lot of fun to, to punish her and they were bored. And sometimes she was punished for things that she couldn't even imagine on her own. When it came back time for her to go back down to the basement, Coy would sometimes, or Richard, or whoever was there, they would grasp her and and hold her arms behind her back by the wrist, 
but she resisted every step of the way until Gertie showed them a little secret into how to get her down into the basement the fastest way possible, okay? Gertie opened up the basement door. Sylvia's in the doorway. Gertie plants her foot in the middle of Sylvia's back and kicks her, and she falls down the stairs, rounding each of the turns in these stairs before landing on the very cement-hard ground of the basement. And this was funny. So the next time Coy had her or Richard had her by her wrist behind her back, they just shove her. There was no more carrying her down the stairs or forcing her down the stairs. No, let's get the door open and push and close the door. That was it. While living in the basement, she had no choice but to live off of the diet that Gertrude and Paula deemed perfect for her, which consisted of crackers and water. Nine times out of ten, it was just the water. And probably half of the times that it was just the water, it was just a half a cup of water that she was instructed she needed to make last all day long. Another time, Gertrude demanded that she needed something else. And she sent her 12-year-old son, Johnny, out for some shit. And Johnny returned with a dirty diaper from Dennis Jr., this is the one-year-old. And when Sylvia refused to eat the contents of the diaper, because we all would, because gross, Johnny decided he'd rub it all over her mouth and face. But this wasn't enough. So the next time that she needed a glass of water, she received a glass of urine. This is, I have a hard time with this, this part of the story, because I don't deal with that very well. It's very disgusting. It turns my stomach. And I probably could have skipped this, but that's not who I am. I'm the librarian. I go in as deep as I can get. Sometimes the details are not great. Sometimes they're disgusting. But in order to understand the psychological side of this, you have to see and you have to hear about some of the different ways that they tortured her. And this was one of them. This made her feel a centimeter tall. This proved to her that she was not worthy of the same thing the other kids were eating. This, this meant to her that she was lacking exactly what Gertrude said she was. That she wasn't good enough. That's all of this. All of this plays a psychological role in her and her torture. Sylvia and her hygiene seemed to be the focal point for Gertie, but not because she needed to keep the wounds clean or anything. I mean, she really wasn't there to um, make sure that Sylvia survived or had any form of relief from what the punishments were. Instead, this just turned into another form of punishment because the bathwater would be completely drawn from the hot water spigot. There would be no mixture of cold water and hot water and, and maybe it was a little too hot entirely draining the family's hot water tank. I almost said what hot water heater and I know that's I know that's wrong, but I'm from the South and I think that's what we call it is the hot water heater. So anyways, but Sylvia willfully getting into this tub is not going to happen. We all have that moment when we touch something or put our hand into really hot water and you immediately withdraw because the sting is so bad. You don't willfully hold your body part into that hot water. It's, it's a fight or flight response. So for Sylvia, it wasn't, she didn't willfully climb into these baths that were scalding hot water. No, she was forced into them by Gertrude, Paula, Johnny, Coy, Richard, whoever was home to help Gertie push her into the tub because she would use her feet and her hands, whatever she could to keep from being pushed and held down into this water. So eventually they get the broad idea, hey, let's uh, bind her hands and her feet and then she can't, she can't use her feet or her hands to help. So this works, except for the fact that she screams bloody murder. 
And at that time, your neighbor is in with earshot, could hear this going on. So Johnny gets the broad idea to not only bind her hands and feet, but hey, let's gag her, right? So she would be forced to strip, forced to sit in this hot water, and she would cry and she would scream. One time during this bathing or hygiene moment, Sylvia passed out from the pain. And in order for Gertie to wake her back up, she slammed her head against the side of the tub until she opened her eyes again. Back then, you didn't have these like plastic mold tubs that were almost hollow from the fiberglass and everything else they were formed out of. No, you had these very porcelain, very steel tubs that hurt. (laughs) That's the only way I know how to put this. It was not a pleasant thing for her to just have her head bounced off the side of the tub like a basketball. But it worked and she woke back up. This comes into play as we watch Sylvia and her health diminish head injuries. Those are the focal point once we get to the autopsy. Now, there was some sort of first aid happening uh, during these, for treatment of these sores, right? Gertie would rub rubbing alcohol into these wounds. Not, not the ones that were caused by the cigarettes. No, no, those are little. Those are very minimal. Again, that's sarcasm. No, it's the bigger weeping wounds that she would develop from either Johnny stepping on her and twisting his foot and causing kind of like an Indian burn style wound or being slapped with the police leather belt or whatever, however they got him. She would rub rubbing alcohol into that and that's that's painful. It, I mean, it did keep the wound clean. However... It wasn't used for that. It was used to cause pain. There was another time that Paula tried to administer first aid and she was rubbing some salt into a larger wound on Sylvia's knee. It was missing the skin and she just had like a pinch of it and she's rubbing it in and Coy's like, no, that's not how you do it. He picks up a handful of the salt and just grinds it into that very raw flesh, causing Sylvia to scream. There was another injury to Sylvia on her head caused by Gertie holding her head under scalding hot water. And it was where her skin had blistered and the blister had popped and peeled away, revealing raw nerves and and capillaries. So Paula decided that in order to keep the area clean, she would cut away Sylvia's hair. And Sylvia, in her psychological abuse, she was, she was compliant. She's like, I need a haircut. Thank you for giving me a haircut. But she did ask to keep a lock of her hair as a souvenir, and Paula didn't allow it. The last weekend of Sylvia's life began with another situation with the Pepsi bottle. Gertie had gone off to the doctor Uh, as she was having a hard time breathing and she was concerned that they may actually put her in the hospital at this time between her bronchitis and the nerves. And so when she left, she told Jenny that if they put her in the hospital, that Jenny would be punished just like Sylvia. Fortunately for Jenny, Gertie was not placed in the hospital that day. Sylvia was called up to the main level of the home from the basement And Ricky was in the home right after Gertie had come home from the doctor. And they were in the kitchen and Sylvia was standing there and she had a blouse and some shorts on. And this had been the first time Ricky had seen Sylvia in a couple days. And looking at her, he could see that her body had all these cigarette burns and bruises all over the place. And Gertie asked Ricky, do you know how to give a tattoo? And he said, well, kind of, sure. And then she turned to Sylvia and she said, you know what a tattoo is, right? And Sylvia said, yes. And then Gertie turned to the group that was forming in the kitchen. And then back to Sylvia and said, quote, 
You branded my daughter, so I'm going to brand you. Gertie then turned to the other wor- others and said, She's a prostitute and she's proud of it, so we'll put it on her stomach. She ordered one of her daughters to go and get a sewing needle and she wanted Sylvia to strip. And Sylvia was hesitant, as any of us would be, not really knowing what this whole tattoo process is going to entail. But nevertheless, Gertie went over, pulled her blouse off, pulled her shorts down, and she was in the kitchen naked. And Gertie pulled up a chair from the dining room table to where Sylvia was standing in the corner. And she took the needle and she drug it on Sylvia's stomach across the skin and she got the eye she managed to carve in the apostrophe and then one of the legs for the letter m and it's at that point that she became nauseous and sick and instructed ricky to finish the job so ricky took the sewing needle and had shirley light a match where they heated the needle to, you know, disinfect it because sanitizing was was the best thing. Whatever. He then turned to Gertrude and he said, how do you spell prostitute? So Gertrude took out a piece of paper and she spelled out the entire phrase. I am a prostitute and I am proud of it. And Ricky began dragging the needle into her skin. Sylvia screamed. She pleaded with Ricky to stop. He refused, and had she flinched or moved or whatever could alter the outcome of the words, he would slap her upside the head to get her to sit still. So most of the time during the tattooing process was Sylvia screaming and crying and pleading for him to stop, but he knew he couldn't. He needed to finish what Gertrude wanted him to do. After the sentence was etched out, Randy Leeper was knocking at the front door and Gertrude demanded that Sylvia go downstairs and get dressed because Randy shouldn't see her naked, right? Even though he'd seen her use a Pepsi bottle inappropriately, but no, he couldn't see her naked. So, so Sylvia went down to the basement, put her clothes back on, and when she was done, she was paraded in front of Randy and very visible on her stomach was the phrase that they had just got done scratching into the skin. After that, Ricky and Shirley decided that they needed to brand Sylvia with an S. So Ricky sent Shirley to go look for an object that they could heat up and use it to make the letter S. She finds about a three foot long crowbar and she decided that the the end that's curved, they could burn it and singe it into the skin one way, flip it and singe it into the the skin the opposite way and cause this S, right? So they began to heat the crowbar with matches, but in the end, Shirley just ended up burning her fingers more than she was heating up the crowbar. So Ricky got together a bunch of newspaper, set it on fire in the basement and heated it up that way. And either he or Shirley misunderstood the direction they were supposed to press the crowbar into Sylvia's skin because she ended up with the number three in her chest just above the statement. And so now Sylvia was not only labeled as a proud prostitute, She had been branded and therefore Gertie decided nobody was going to want her anymore. When Ricky and Shirley showed Gertie what they had done, she asked Sylvia, quote, Sylvia, what are you going to do now? You can't get married. Now what are you going to do? And Sylvia, she didn't answer. I don't know if she was in shock or if maybe she thought that remaining silent would be less likely to induce a a rage out of Gertrude. I don't know. For whatever reason, she decided I'm not answering that freaking question. She was in the long run at this point, becoming more and more self-aware of her outcome in life. Although I do not think that she thought it was going to happen so soon. 
That night after her body had been tattooed and branded, Sylvia was allowed to sleep upstairs and she lay on a mattress in the middle of the floor in pain. Everything hurt. Her head was pounded on, slammed into the floor and walls. Her body had been used as an ashtray, etched, burned, and scalded. She had been through so much torture and the effects were starting to take a serious toll on her. Sunday afternoon came around and Gertie and Stephanie bathed Sylvia, this time not with scalding water, but a warm water where they did incorporate the cool water tap so that it was manageable for Sylvia to sit in the tub and be cleaned. After the bath, Sylvia wrote out a formal letter to her parents that was dictated by Gertrude and Paula, saying, quote, to Mr. and Mrs. Likings, I went with a gang of boys in the middle of the night, and they said that they would pay me if I would give them something. So I got in the car, and they all got what they wanted, and when they finished, they beat me up and left sores on my face and all over my body. And they also put on my stomach, I am a prostitute and proud of it. I have done just about everything that I could do to make Gertie mad and cause Gertie more money than she's got. I've tore up a new mattress and peed on it. I have also cost Gertie doctor bills that she really can't pay and made Gertie a nervous wreck and all of her kids. I cost her $35 for a hospital in one day and I wouldn't do anything around the house. I have done anything to do things to make out of the way to make things worse for them. End quote. That last sentence, I did not mess up. It is written this way. And when you have two people, one of them heavily medicated, trying to dictate this letter, and then the person who is writing it down is starting to suffer from deficits mentally, physically, you have this miscommunication and this letter is shown to police later and had they looked at it and read it in its entirety, that right there would show them Sylvia didn't die from being beat up by a gang of boys who wanted nothing more than sex from her. There's more to the story. This letter was obviously odd, especially in the way it addressed, but when Sylvia had started writing this letter, she did write, Dear Mom and Dad. But she was told by Gertie and Paula, you're not going to write it that way, and made her start over and be more formal in her address. Gertrude, at this point, began thinking of ways to get Sylvia out of the home, out of fear of what was to come. Maybe this was overwhelming at this point and the possible consequences began drowning Gertrude and her consciousness in her own head. I don't know. But at this point, she's she's trying to get Sylvia out of the home because they may have taken it too far and it can't come back on Gertie, right? So by Monday, Sylvia, she's starting to feel a lot better. And this last weekend of torture that began with the tattooing and the branding and everything in between, it was getting better. She had the strength to climb the stairs and she took a bath and she talked with Stephanie. Like I said, Stephanie was still very much fighting for her when she could. Gertrude had assured Stephanie that when the first time she saw the etching of the words and the brand, she was concerned that this would forever scar her and Gertie said no it'll get better and it'll fade away it's you know don't worry about it but in this moment while Sylvia is bathing Stephanie is highly skeptical that this is gonna fade it's looking gross it's looking disgusting Gertie she had been back to the doctor and at this point it's for vomiting and nervousness And this is the vomiting and the nervousness are probably part of her body's response to the utter fear coming from the fact that she knows we may have taken this too far. Once Gertie got back, she slapped Sylvia, blaming her for what was going on in her own health. Instead of taking the blame and being like, I've abused you so bad that now I'm scared that I'm going to get in trouble. No, she didn't do that. 
She didn't take it that way. Now she's like, well, if you wouldn't have came in my home, then I wouldn't have abused you and I wouldn't be nervous and I wouldn't be sick to my stomach. It's all your fault. It comes back to you. So Johnny punches Sylvia and Randy Leeper, he's standing in the home watching all of this happen and he's doing nothing. Nothing. Gertrude then instructs Jenny to go upstairs and get dressed because she and Johnny are going to blindfold Sylvia, take her to the forest, and lose her. This is one of the few times that Sylvia does react to what is fixing to happen, and she makes a run for it. She's scared, and she's tired. She makes it to the front porch before Gertrude grabs her by the arm and pulls her back in the home. She's terrified that if the neighbors see her in this condition with this choppy hair that's disheveled and all these bruises and marks and wounds all over her, they'll think that Gertie's being the one abusive. And she is. However, she doesn't want people to think that. How could they? So as punishment for her attempted escape, Gertie picks up one of two brass curtain rods and beats Sylvia in the head until that rod is bent at a 90 degree angle. She drops it, picks up the other brass curtain rod and continues to beat her more upside her head until that is also at a 90 degree angle. At this point, Koi has stopped by the house after getting off of work and the side of what's happening in the Baines Whiskey's home and the beating, it all stopped with one blow from Koi. A single-handed swing of a broom handle connects with the side of Sylvia's head, and he knocks her unconscious. Sylvia is dragged back to the basement while she is still unconscious from the blow of Koi, and this would be the last time that Koi Hubbard would see Sylvia Likens alive. What happened that night after everybody left is only known by two people, Sylvia and Gertrude. But the neighbors heard loud commotions coming from the Baines Whiskey's home up until about 3 a.m. that morning. Sylvia can't tell us what happened that night in the basement, and Gertrude, she wasn't going to tell anybody either. Sylvia's last day alive was spent propped up in the kitchen, and Gertie is trying to feed her donuts and milk. And Sylvia, she's no longer in control of her body and her muscles. And she wasn't able to eat what Gertie is trying to feed her. And she becomes frustrated and Gertie throws her to the ground and then realizes, no, I'm supposed to be helping her get back to normal, pick her back up, prop her back up. And at this point, Sylvia picks up the glass of milk. But because of her spastic muscle movement, she throws the glass of milk. That's now two glasses of milk she has wasted that Dennis Wright Jr. cannot drink. This pisses Gertrude off. So when Paula comes home from her new job at a cafeteria downtown because she was fired from the drugstore for being immature, and she sees what's going on and Sylvia's laying in the basement floor and she's reciting her ABCs, but she cannot get past the fourth letter. She sings A, B, C, D over and over and over because she cannot remember what comes past it. Gertrude's yelling at Sylvia to get herself up and clean herself because she has moved her bowels at this point. And in between Gertie telling her to get up and clean herself up, she's also telling her, quit faking it. You're just a faker. You're nothing but a faker. She's not faking it at this point this point, there's swelling due to the amount of injuries that occurred to her head from the repeated blows that was performed by Gertrude and Coy in the last days. There's malnutrition, which is inhibiting the way she can think. There's dehydration that is occurring. All of this is taking its toll on Sylvia, and it doesn't look good. Paula begins to threaten Sylvia because she's not getting up. She's not going and cleaning herself. And she tells her if she doesn't get up, she is going to beat her. Soon, the kids in the home 
are from the neighborhood. All the kids from the neighborhood are in the home. And they're in the basement and they're watching what's going down with Sylvia. Sylvia, she she recognizes Richard Hobbs and she points to him and she says, you're Ricky. And then she sees Gertrude standing amongst the onlookers and she points to her and she says, and you're Gertie. And Gertie flies off the handle at this point and she's, you know, yelling at her to stop faking. You know who I am. Stop faking. This isn't funny. And Sylvia, she's got a hold of this pear and she's trying to take a bite out of it. And she tells Jenny and Gertie and Paula, those standing closest, it feels like my teeth are all loose. And Jenny gets down to her level and she says, Sylvia, you're missing your front tooth. Don't you remember the accident from when you were a kid? You can't bite right there. And this fruit is rotten, so it's soft. And Sylvia still cannot take a bite out of it. Eventually, Sylvia gets herself up and she takes a few steps towards the stairs and she collapses. And Gertie gets really mad. She's really, really mad at this point. She's enraged. She's not in control of her actions. And that is that absolutely no excuse for her at all. None. However, I don't know of, a, of an adult who could not control themselves at this point. You can realize that the decision you are making is not the right decision. Yet, she still makes it. Gertie puts one foot on the side of Sylvia's head and stands up, lifting herself from the floor using just one foot to add the weight to Sylvia's head. And Gertie decides that's not enough. So she puts her other foot on Sylvia's head. And this time her full weight is on the head of this child. Randy goes and grabs his family's garden hose and brings it back to the Baines Whiskey home down to the basement so that they can spray it out and clean where Sylvia had gone to the restroom. And Johnny is spraying Sylvia with this hose just all over and they're laughing and this is a fun ha 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 moment. And Stephanie, she gets home from school, she puts her books down, and she hears the commotion coming from the basement, so she goes down there, and what she sees is Johnny spraying Sylvia with the hose, the neighborhood children laughing, there's an obvious mess, Sylvia does not look coherent, she doesn't look good at all, and so she yells at Johnny to turn the hose off, and then Stephanie tries to pick Sylvia up and take her upstairs, but she can't. She's a little too heavy for Stephanie. So Ricky helps Stephanie and they pick Sylvia up and they're taking her up the stairs. And because she is dripping wet, uh, Ricky loses his holding on Sylvia and he drops her and her head bangs against the stairs, um, causing yet another injury to Sylvia and her head and her brain. They do eventually get her up the stairs and into the second floor so Stephanie can give her a bath. And Gertie's still going through the house screaming and hollering that Sylvia's faking it and she needs to stop faking it. And Stephanie, she can't think with her mother yelling. And they turn the bath water on and they start to undress her. And Gertie says there's no time, just bathe her with her clothes on. So Ricky and Stephanie put her into the tub and they get her cleaned up. They get her out, they dry her off, and they dress her in some warmer clothing. And they lay her onto a mattress. And at this point, Sylvia has only made one coherent sentence in all the time that she's been trying to talk. And she tells Stephanie, I wish my daddy was here. After they get her onto the mattress, Gertrude is still yelling, saying she's nothing but a faker and that she needs to wake up. So in order to prove the point that she is a faker and that she does need to wake up, Gertie picks up a freaking book and then hits Sylvia in the head with that book multiple times. 
At this point, Ricky can identify that this situation is grave and he grabs Gertie and pushes her from the room and nearly down the stairs trying to get her to stop attacking Sylvia. And once he gets back in the room, Stephanie's in there with Sylvia. Now Shirley's in the room and she has some hot tea and she's asking Stephanie how Sylvia is. And Stephanie assures her that she's going to be all right. And then she looks over to Ricky and she's like, you need to call the doctor. Ricky ends up calling the police instead. In a last minute plea, Sylvia asked Stephanie to please take her home. After that statement, Sylvia takes a last breath and stops breathing. Ricky asks if Stephanie knows how to do mouth to mouth and she says yes. And the Ricky and Stephanie work to revive Sylvia and they were able to get her breathing again for just a moment. And at this point, Gertrude is back into the room screaming that Sylvia is nothing but a, a faker. And Stephanie, she loses her cool and tells her mom to get out of the room, stop screaming, that she and Ricky are going to take care of this. But by the time the police arrive, within just minutes of them being called, Sylvia's dead. The torture had killed her. October 26, 1965, at 627 p.m., Patrolman Melvin D. Dixon receives a call from dispatch, quote, go to 3850 East New York Street to investigate a possible dead girl. He had no idea he would be the first to arrive on the scene of the most heinous crime in Indianapolis's history. He was on scene within minutes of the call. Homicide cars had been dispatched along with backup, and he knew it wasn't going to be your typical fainting spell or cut that people thought they may die from or bleed out before help can get there. Gertrude met Dixon, handing him a note from Sylvia, who had pinned to her parents, and showed him where Sylvia was. Gertrude explained that Sylvia had showed up in the backyard about an hour ago, bare-breasted and sporting the I'm a prostitute and proud of it tattoo. Sylvia had been a boarder of hers and had ran away a few days ago with a gang of boys. And this is how she returned to the home. Dixon walks into the room and outstretched on the mattress of the floor was the very frail 16-year-old Sylvia Likens. The sweater she was wearing rode up displaying the etching. I'm a prostitute and proud of it along with her three brand her light brown hair was shaggy and short. The entire left side of her face was discolored where the skin was eroding away. She was covered in sores in all sizes and at different stages of healing. Deputy Coroner Dr. Arthur Paul Keeble arrived on scene about an hour after Dixon. By this point, Sylvia was in complete rigor and her body temperature was that of the room thus indicating that Sylvia may have been dead at approximately eight hours. However, noting that she had been recently bathed either just prior to her death or post-mortem, and this would speed up rigor and speed up the lowering of her body temperature. Noted were large bruises on the left side of her head around the temporal region. A tooth was missing, we know this to be prior to her coming to the Baines Whiskey home. She had cuts, burns, scald marks. They all riddled her body. Numerous patches where her skin was eroding away, possibly caused of scalding water or acid. There were more than a hundred small wounds known to be cigarette burns. And one of them being on her wrist so deep it was almost to the bone. Sylvia's vagina was noted as swollen and puffy, and he was surprised that there were no signs of sexual molestation based off the appearance of her genital area. Her back was discolored and bruised, being roughly the size of a hand. Various wounds were at different points of the healing process. Gertrude stayed close to the examiner, saying that she had been applying rubbing alcohol as a form of first aid. And she's not lying. She just wasn't doing it for first aid purposes. 
Betty and Lester Likens were in Jacksonville, Florida at the last fair of the season when they were woke from their slumber from a former neighbor, D.L. Burton. He called to inform them that Sylvia had been found dead. Neither one of them could believe what they had just been told, and with the help of some people from their carnival, they got on a plane headed back to Indianapolis. Once Sylvia's body was transported back to the precinct, pathologist Dr. Charles R. Ellis performed the autopsy, finding more than the initial documentation of the coroner. Sylvia's lips were shredded. Her fingernails were broken backward, all ten. Numerous areas where there were patchy skin loss. Examination of her internal organs offered a deeper look at the torture that Sylvia suffered from. Her liver was fatty and yellow, indicative of malnutrition. Alterations in her kidneys were noted, indicating that she had been in shock prior to her death for as many as three days. Her brain showed free blood that had not been clotted and needed to be drained off. This was possibly why Sylvia was in and out of consciousness in those last days. The autopsy also confirmed not only was Sylvia a virgin, but she was not pregnant and never had been, proving that Gertrude had done nothing but lied about the girl and her virtue to the young, impressionable teens that trotted in and out of her home. The cause of death was listed as subdural hematoma caused by a blow to the head with shock, malnutrition, and excessive injuries as underlying factors. At the scene, many of the kids were questioned, with Jenny being the first followed by Ricky. Jenny told the police that she would tell them everything if they got her out of that home. That night after 9 p.m., police knocked on the Hobbs' front door and Ricky's father answered and the patrolman told him Ricky needed to come with them. Ricky was taken down to the precinct for further questioning. Ricky was told that Jenny had implicated him in the death of her sister. Detective Sergeant Kaiser told Ricky's father that he had better get an attorney for his son. Ricky's father stated that if his son had been involved with the death of the girl, that he wanted Ricky to cooperate fully and tell the police the truth. Finally, Ricky admitted to his guilt in his part of the murder, saying that he had tattooed and branded Sylvia along with hitting her anywhere from 10 to 15 times on the chest and back. Ricky was asked by a newspaper reporter... Quote, why didn't Sylvia get up and leave? Was she a masochist? And Ricky replied, quote, to tell you the truth, I don't know Sylvia that well. It was just a casual relationship, end quote. Next up for questioning was Gertrude Wright Baines Whiskey. Detective Kaiser did learn that Gertrude's legal name was Baines Whiskey as she and Dennis Wright had never been married. She fidgeted and told Kaiser that she had been treated for nerves and asthma as almost as an explanation to what her part was in the role of this murder. This didn't sway Kaiser and his belief that she was part of this far more than she was willing to let on and told her that he was going to charge her with preliminary murder and she could get an attorney if she wished. All six of the Baines Whiskey children were taken to the juvenile center and held as material witnesses. Richard Hobbs was transported to the hospital where he learned he was a diabetic and would stay there chained to his bed until his murder trial seven months later. Richard was allowed to visit his mother prior to the end of her battle with cancer and the police worked with the Hobbs family to hide Richard's custody status. On November 11th, he was allowed to attend his mother's funeral, again hiding Ricky and his custody. On October 27th, Gertrude was talked to again by Kaiser and this time L.T. Spurgeon D. Davenport. It was during this interview without an attorney that Gertrude admitted to knowing that the kids were mistreating Sylvia. So Gertie's defense was Sylvia was the bad guy. Throw her under the bus. It's because of Sylvia these things are happening. Run her over with the bus. We've been caught. Well, it's because of the children these things happen to Sylvia. Throw them under the bus. I was not able to control these children. Run them over with the bus. 
It didn't matter who stood in the way between Gertie and getting out of trouble. She was going to sell you down river to save her own ass. And she didn't care. She didn't care that they, that, those were her children. She didn't care that they were children of other people. She didn't care that she was guilty of torture and murder. She didn't care. All she cared about was not having to face the consequences of her actions. That's it. That's all she cared about. Gertrude also claimed that she had only made Sylvia sleep in the basement about three times during her stay with the Baines Whiskies. They asked her if the reason she was making Sylvia sleep in the basement was because Gertrude had injured her kidneys with the fraternity-style paddle to which Gertrude insisted she knew nothing about. She would admit to telling Johnny to go get shit so Sylvia could eat it. Another omission was burning Sylvia on the arm by accident about a month prior to her death. But in all, she threw anyone and everyone under the bus, including Paula, telling them, Paula was the worst. She beat her the worst. She broke her wrist after hitting her in the jaw. And then there's Coy Hubbard. He he came in and out of my house and he beat her up too. As a matter of fact, he kind of did most of the beating. That was the way she gave over information. She She implicated others as having a far bigger role than they did. Betty and Lester Likens had made it into Indianapolis on October 27th to claim their daughter. They were able to sit down with the detectives and look over Jenny's signed state. Lester says he couldn't even finish it. He was so shocked that he never saw the signs of abuse that his girls were enduring during the time they were living with the Baines Whiskies. And neither girl, they never said a word. On October 29th, Gertrude refused to sign the paperwork from the transcript of her interview from a few days prior. She insisted that she didn't need an attorney because she didn't do anything wrong. And inside the Hitch funeral home, mourners remembered the young Sylvia. Tears fell for each wound that she had left the world with. Reverend Lewis Gibson tried to reassure and soothe those in attendance that Sylvia was in heaven with their Lord and Savior. A 14-car procession took Sylvia home to her final resting place, gone from the world that she suffered so much in her last few months of life. Gertrude and her band of teenagers could never hurt her again. Investigators had now heard Coy Hubbard's name more than once, and they were set out to find out who he was and what was his actual role in this murder. Coy was picked up and brought to the precinct where he declined to involve his parents, much like Richard Hobbs did. However, Coy's mother joined him at his side despite his wishes. Coy began admitting to hurting Sylvia, hitting her with his hand, and he couldn't remember why. Flipping her onto the floor without the protection of the mattress during his judo flips. Burning her on the arm with a match. And just before her death, taking her down the basement stairs, holding her by the wrist behind her back. And just before the landing, shoving her the last few steps down. Paula Baines Whiskey signed a statement to her involvement as well. In the three months, she told them she hit her with a police belt about 25 times on the butt. She broke her wrist, hitting Sylvia in the jaw. She gave her a black eye and she pushed her down the stairs anywhere from two to three times. Little Johnny Baines Whiskey signed a statement to his involvement as well, which included spanking her, using his fist to hit her. Throwing matches at her and stubbing his mother's lit cigarettes out on her. Gagging her so she wouldn't make too much noise when everyone was hitting her or dunking her into the scolding water. And then he implicated others. He said Paula was part of it, Stephanie, Marie, Shirley, and then the neighborhood kids, Anna Sisko, Judy Duke, Darlene McGuire, Darlene introduced the Likens girls to the Baines Whiskey family. 
Randy Leeper, Mike Monroe, Coy Hubbard, Richard Hobbs, all of them arrested and charged with injury to a person. On November 1st of 1965, Judge Harry F. Zacklin ordered that Gertrude, Paula, Stephanie, Johnny, and Richard Hobbs were to be held on the charge of murder without bail. Everyone except Richard were ordered to be kept at the Marion County Jail. Richard did return to his hospital bed where he was being treated for his diabetes. Coy Hubbard's case was issued a continuance until November 24th of 1965. Anna Sisko, Judy Duke, Randy Lepper, and Mike Monroe were all held at the Juvenile Center for Delinquency Charges. On December 4th of 1965, the grand jury in Marion County were finally able to hear the evidence that the state of Indiana had against Gertrude and the teens for their role in the murder of Sylvia. The day prior, on December 3rd, the Baines Whiskey's family attorney had filed a writ of habeas corpus for Stephanie to get her out on bond, saying that not only did the state have zero evidence to support the murder charge against her, It was also illegal to hold Stephanie from school set forth by the state education board. And the judge asked Stephanie if she liked school. And Stephanie replied with, judge, if school were a man, I'd marry it. She was, however, transferred to the juvenile center, even though her bond was denied, so that she would be able to attend school through their education program. Stephanie also waived any immunity offered to her and testified to the grand jury about what had happened in the home. Jenny Likens took the stand to testify with the grand jury as well, as well as two of the policemen who responded to the call on October 26th. Finally, Gertrude Baines Whiskey asked to be heard by the grand jury. This would come to embarrass Gertrude later. Why? Because generally, information heard by the grand jury is secretive. However, there are provisions that have made the testimony available to be heard. One of those provisions? To impeach a witness and prosecuting a perjury case. This is where it came to bite Gertrude in the ass. She lied through her teeth and they caught her. On December 21st of 1965, the final matter before the grand jury could rule occurred. Coy Hubbard walked away from the courtroom after being arraigned with a murder charge. On December 30th of 1965, first degree murder indictments were handed down to 37-year-old Gertrude Baines Whiskey, 17-year-old Paula Baines Whiskey, 15-year-old Stephanie Baines Whiskey, 12-year-old Johnny Baines Whiskey, 15-year-old Coy Hubbard, and 15-year-old Richard Hobbs. Anna Sisko, Judy Duke, Randy Leeper, and Mike Monroe were all released without any further charges to their parents' custody. Marie Baines Whiskey, Shirley Baines Whiskey, and Jimmy Baines Whiskey were scattered into the foster system, none of them allowed to be within the same foster family. Judge Saul Rabb's courtroom was where the first-degree murder charges were handed down. Therefore, he would be presiding over the trial. He was known for expediting court proceedings, and the Likens case proved to him the need for a speedy trial. John R. Hammond, he is the Baines Whiskey's family attorney, he decided it was a conflict of interest in representing the family as a whole. Therefore, he began dealing out his clients to other lawyers. William Urbecker was handed Gertrude. George P. Rice was handed Paula. Forrest B. Bowman Jr. was handed Johnny and eventually Coy. James Nadif was handed Richard Hobbs and John Hammond himself. He kept Stephanie. She was the easier case. Just FYI. On January 13th of 1966, Gertrude was sent to Marion County General Hospital for a mental evaluation after proclaiming insanity as a defense. And according to the law, the arrested must undergo a mental evaluation in order to stand trial. Once they claim insanity, we have to provide them with the medical evaluations necessary to prove whether they are competent or not to stand trial. 
Paula followed her mother to Marion County General Hospital, but not for her evaluation just yet. She gave birth on January 13th of 1966 to a baby girl who she had named Gertrude. The infant was immediately placed into the foster system and eventually adopted. Afterwards, Paula did undergo a mental evaluation for her claim of insanity. On January 28th of 1966, Gertrude's evaluation findings were presented to the court And doctors found her to be of sound mind and that she was competent to stand trial. On April 16th, 1966, Prosecutor Deputy Leroy New announced the state would be seeking the death penalty in all of those charged with first degree murder. There were also several motions filed. They included breaking up the defendants instead of trying them as a one where all five of them six of them were tried together. They wanted to break them up and each of them get an individual murder trial. That didn't fly. Judge Rabb denied that motion and every other motion that followed that asked for the same thing. There was another motion filed by all of the defendants requesting a change in venue as the murder was highly publicized with the local newspapers. Again, those motions were denied, and on April 18th of 1966, the trial of the century began with jury selection. Part of the prosecution and their witness was Jenny Likens, Deanna Shoemaker, and Shirley Baines Whiskey, along with Stephanie Baines Whiskey. All of them set to testify against everyone charged for first-degree murder. On May 19, 1966, 17 days into the trial, the jury had come back after eight hours of deliberation. Gertrude was found guilty of first-degree murder and handed a sentence of life. Paula was found guilty of second-degree murder with a sentence of life. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Spain's Whiskey were convicted of manslaughter and handed a sentence of 2 to 21 years. John Baines Whiskey became the youngest convicted murderer in Indiana state history. In September of 1970, the Indiana Supreme Court reversed the convictions due to being denied the change of venue and being denied the opportunity to separate the defendants into individual trials. Gertrude Baines Whiskey was tried again and found guilty of first-degree murder for the second time, and she was handed the sentence of life. Paula avoided another trial and pled guilty to manslaughter with the sentence of 2 to 20 years and was released in 1971. Johnny, Coy, and Richard were released after just two years served. Gertrude walked from Indiana Woman's Prison in 1985. She had become a model prisoner, even earning the title as Den Mother. She finally took responsibility for her role in Sylvia's murder and showed remorse. She claimed to being on drugs at the time and her role was still unclear to her, but that she took full responsibility for the death of Sylvia Likens. More than 40,000 signatures were collected in a last-minute ditch effort to deny her parole. The plea had fallen on deaf ears. After her release, she changed her name to Nadine Vaughn Fawson and went on to live a life in Iowa until her death on June 16, 1990, from lung cancer. Gertrude maintained the notion of not truly knowing her role in the death of Sylvia through her final moment. Paula went on to live life with a new identity as Paula Pace. She worked for 14 years at the Iowa Beeman Conrad Liscombe Union Witten School District as a counselor before the district ultimately learned her true identity and her criminal background for which she was fired. The charges against Stephanie were dropped after she agreed to turn and become part of the state's witnesses. Stephanie assumed a new name and went on to become a school teacher, and she currently lives in Florida. 
Johnny Bean's whiskey went on to become a minister and counselor to children of divorced parents. Coy Hubbard led a life that caused him to be in and out of prison, including the murder of two men in 1977. After the release of the 2007 film American Crime, Coy was fired from his job and died shortly after of a heart attack at the age of 56. Richard Hobbs' life was short. On January 2nd of 1972, at the age of 21, he died after a short battle with cancer. In the four years after his release, it was rumored that Richard suffered at least one mental breakdown. Betty and Lester continued their life with the carnival, still unable to care for Jenny, and she was ultimately placed with the prosecutor and his wife. She went on to marry and have two children, and on June 23, 2004, Jenny passed away from a heart attack at the age of 54. Betty Likens passed in 1999, and Lester Likens passed in 2013. The house at 3850 East New York Street was leveled for parking, but the memory of the torture and murder of Sylvia Marie Likens still stands. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we wrapped up the case of Sylvia Marie Likens at the hands of an overly stressed and hateful woman who took advantage of the situation as a means for more money. Gertrude may have never taken care of the poor young boarder, but the justice system took care of those involved in her suffering. Tonight, I leave you with a line that hung on the walls of the courtroom of Judge Saul Rabb. Justice delayed is justice denied. Much love, the true crime librarian.